Welcome to the Tim Booker channel. Wisdom is worth sharing. Wishing you a pleasant listening experience. The book we are going to talk about today is Getting More. Here, when we talk about negotiations, it's not just something negotiation experts do every day, or business negotiations where company executives acquire other businesses. The concept of negotiation here is broader, encompassing how one interacts and communicates with people in both personal and professional life to achieve their objectives. This includes scenarios like haggling in a market, standing up for your rights while on vacation, or convincing your girlfriend's parents when they disapprove. These are all real-life negotiation situations. So, how can you achieve your goals in such negotiations and secure more for yourself? That's what this book aims to teach, the most useful and effective negotiation techniques and strategies. This book is based on a negotiation course at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania and has been one of the most popular courses for over a decade. The author, Stuart Diamond, is a Harvard Law School graduate and a world-renowned negotiation expert. He has provided consulting services to many Fortune 500 companies like Google, Microsoft, J.P. Morgan Chase, and has also conducted negotiation training for government leaders in over 40 countries, including the United Nations. One of his remarkable achievements was persuading Bolivian farmers in the jungle region, primarily cultivating coca, the raw material for cocaine, to stop growing coca and switch to cultivating bananas. He also helped many parents easily ensure their children brush their teeth regularly and go to bed on time. So, what are his exceptional negotiation techniques and strategies, and how did he achieve these results? Let's delve deeper. First, let's consider how most people typically approach negotiations. For example, in The Godfather movie, there's a classic negotiation scene where the Godfather, on behalf of his friend, is trying to persuade a landlord not to evict the friend's dog. The landlord is initially unmoved by emotional appeals but eventually agrees when offered six months' rent up front, far exceeding his expectations. Before leaving, the Godfather leaves a cryptic message for the landlord, causing him to back down. In this negotiation, we can see several techniques at play, including appeals to emotion, monetary incentives, and the subtle use of power. In many movies and books, the most effective negotiation methods often revolve around money and power. Traditionally, negotiations have been about resolving conflicts and disputes by gaining an advantage over the other party and compelling them to act according to your wishes, often through the exercise of power. However, in the 1980s, lawyers pioneered modern negotiations, emphasizing courtroom-style adversarial tactics to protect the interests of the disadvantaged party. In this approach, the interests of the more powerful party were often overlooked. In the 1990s, negotiations in the business world began to evolve, with economists, business people, and entrepreneurs employing various negotiation strategies to secure economic advantages and growth opportunities. The highest level of negotiation involves achieving a win-win scenario where the best way to meet both parties' needs is found. Diamond believes that modern negotiations in our everyday lives and work must transcend these traditional methods, moving beyond power and rationality. Instead, he emphasizes the importance of analyzing the specific context of a negotiation, understanding what truly influences the process of negotiation, persuasion, and communication. In essence, it's about identifying the underlying factors that come into play. In this book, Diamond presents over 400 real-life cases he has collected over several decades, including his own experiences, those of his clients, and students. From these cases, he distills over a dozen negotiation strategies, with three core strategies standing out. These strategies are essential for navigating negotiations, whether they involve significant matters or everyday situations. Let's explore these strategies. 1. Clearly define your negotiation goals asterisk your goals are the essence of your negotiation. It's essential to set clear objectives before starting a negotiation. Many people either overlook this step or forget their initial goals during the negotiation process. It's like climbing a ladder and realizing you're against the wrong wall. So, what are your goals? For example, if you want a raise, is it just about the extra money, or do you seek recognition from your boss or a better quality of life? Identifying your deeper goals helps you stay focused and adaptable during the negotiation. If your employer refuses a pay raise, consider alternatives like additional vacation time or a more fulfilling role. Your life and personal development goals remain consistent, even if the specific benefits vary. 
Thus, it's crucial to continually remind yourself of your goals during the negotiation process. Here's the translation of the text. Let's take another example. There's a person who wanted to go to Chicago for an interview, but a sudden snowstorm led to the cancellation of the flight. At first glance, it seemed like the job interview was ruined. But upon reflection, it becomes clear that going to Chicago isn't the ultimate goal, finding a job is. The obstacle to achieving the goal isn't the cancelled flight but whether the prospective employer can gather enough information about you to decide if you should be hired. So, how important is that flight? Diamond provides a statistic, just by setting clear goals, a negotiator's performance can improve by over 25%. Therefore, prioritizing your goals is crucial. It's important to emphasize that everything you do must align with your goal. Many people place too much importance on building good interpersonal relationships, aiming for win-win solutions, and reaching consensus. They focus on these positive outcomes without considering their true objectives. Building positive relationships, achieving win-win situations, and reaching consensus are common negotiation objectives but may not necessarily be your objectives. To reiterate, you don't have to put in the effort to establish so-called good interpersonal relationships unless these relationships bring you closer to your goal. You also don't need to overly concern yourself with others' interests, needs, or emotions unless they help you get closer to your goal. It's crucial to discern these differences. This brings us to the first strategy. The second strategy is to understand who your negotiation partner is and learn as much as possible about their needs. In the end, you have to satisfy their needs to get what you want in the negotiation. A person's needs can vary. We all know that respect is one of the most crucial factors. Respect is like the air, when it's present, you might not notice it, but when it's absent, you can't breathe. Everyone understands this concept, but how do you show respect to the other party? Here's a little trick, you have to empathize with their feelings and adjust your attitude. If possible, genuinely appreciate the other party. For example, one of Diamond's students wanted to buy a suit for an interview. He saw a suit priced at $500, marked down to $350. However, it was still a bit expensive. He took the suit to the counter while the salesperson was busy with several customers. After all the other customers left, the student approached the salesperson and said, Wow, you've had so many customers with so many complaints today. That must have been tough for you. Just think, after a long day like this, I'm probably the first customer to be so friendly and understanding. Think about it. For the salesperson, this student was probably the first customer to be so kind and considerate that day. The student then asked if there could be an additional discount, such as using a store membership card. However, all these attempts were unsuccessful, so the student resorted to pleading, saying, as a genuinely appreciative customer who understands how hard you've been working, could you offer me a goodwill discount? A goodwill discount, a concept that probably doesn't exist in most stores, but the salesperson, after hearing this, laughed and said, how about a $50 discount? These communication skills might not be highly sophisticated, but most people often fail to realize their power. In this instance, the student saved $50. However, in other situations, you might strike a considerably more significant deal. For example, you could increase your annual disposable income by 100%. How does that sound? Respecting the other party's needs in most cases is highly effective, but it must be genuine. As mentioned earlier, many movies or books portray negotiation as a ruthless battle, intended to shame the other party or put them in a disadvantageous position to win. Diamond tells you that this approach is profoundly flawed. Only by showing respect can you encourage the other party to give more. Let's take another example. In the United States, when you're pulled over by a police officer, it's common to receive a ticket. One day, Diamond was pulled over for not wearing a seatbelt. At the time, three cars were pulled over, seemingly for the same reason. However, Diamond first expressed respect to the police officer. He said, Officer, you pulled me over, and I appreciate your diligence in your job. If it weren't for you, I might not have made it. What do you think? The police officer, after hearing this, patted Diamond on the shoulder but did not give him a ticket. The words you say must be sincere. If your words are not heartfelt and you secretly despise the police officers who pull you over, your emotions will show, and you'll likely receive a ticket. The police officer wants to ensure you've learned your lesson and acknowledge it, and they consider how much it costs you. In this case, Diamond said, 
if it weren't for you, I might not have made it. At that point, the police officer didn't need to issue a ticket. The third strategy is also the most crucial one, the skill of leveraging non-equivalence in trade. This strategy is more effective than the traditional win-win approach. What is a non-equivalent trade? It's using something small to obtain a substantial benefit. In the past, traditional negotiations focused more on direct, tangible interest exchanges, primarily money. In other words, the primary focus was on financial transactions. However, things have changed. Some of the most important actions people take in their lives are often not for financial gain, nor to satisfy some material interest. People are increasingly concerned with emotions, in simple terms, exchanging benefits or needs that can be unrelated to the transaction. These can be feelings, and respecting these intangible aspects often helps you achieve more in negotiation. For example, a client wanted to hire a live-in nanny. Another family offered double the salary. In a traditional negotiation model, the client's family might have entered a bidding war. However, they discovered a specific need of the nanny. She was a single mother searching for a care facility for her son with leukemia. The client's family had a physician and a pathology laboratory, so they presented the possibility of helping her. More importantly, they conveyed the feeling of treating her as family. They also found out that the other family, offering a high salary, was a single father. The client's family emphasized their more relaxed and open lifestyle and their stable income. Then, they did something remarkable. They compared the nanny's potential salary with market rates, showing that they were offering a competitive salary. In the end, the nanny chose the client's family despite their lower salary offer. This is a common negotiation scenario in life. In this example, the client's family was initially in a highly disadvantageous position, and double the salary was a significant temptation for the nanny. However, the client's approach was to bypass the issue of salary and address the nanny's needs from other angles. Ultimately, the nanny chose their family because they were able to move her away from the conventional idea of money being the top priority. Behind non-equivalent exchanges is a critical driving force known as intangible assets, things of value beyond money. In a business transaction, the benefits received by parties A, B, and C are often financially competitive. But what usually compels one party to finalize the transaction is something outside of money that they can offer. These are intangible assets, and it's these intangibles that significantly enhance the overall value of your interest, these intangible assets share a common characteristic. They are often things of little value to one person, which means they aren't particularly special to that individual. However, they perfectly align with another person's needs. For example, one of Diamond's students worked in a joint venture company between the United States and Japan. Initially, both sides insisted on having a 51% ownership. Neither was willing to budge. Eventually, they reached a solution. It turned out that the Japanese side was willing to accept 49% ownership, but with one condition, the American company had to retain its Japanese employees. The American side readily agreed because keeping Japanese employees was something they were already doing. It wasn't a significant decision or change for them. As a result, the two sides quickly reached an agreement. This non-equivalent trade is especially effective when dealing with children. In fact, children have always used intangible assets in their trades. For instance, I'll trade my game card for your marbles, or I'll trade my toy for your doll. The items being traded are tangible, but the special emotions attached to these items by children are intangible. It's not just, I don't want this marble anymore, so I'll give it to you. It's, this marble is a cherished possession of mine, or, this game card means a lot to me. This is an essential factor in the trade. Of course, the trade is based on the premise that both parties want each other's possessions. However, what's also being exchanged are the emotions attached to these items, which are intangible. This approach is particularly useful for parents with children. Kids love to participate in setting rules. If they want something, they'll be willing to give up something else. For instance, if a child wants to stay up a bit later and watch more cartoons, the trade condition set by their mother might be not buying snacks on the way to school the next day or practicing the piano for an extra hour tomorrow. The same approach can be used to encourage a child to brush their teeth before bed in exchange for some extra playtime. To summarize, the interests or needs used for trading can be anything, including respect, friendship, affection, a sense of security, or other intangible elements.
These can be related or unrelated to the transaction, rational or irrational, explicit or implicit, long-term or short-term, verbal or non-verbal, significant or minor, and so on. As long as you can identify the other party's needs, which can be diverse in people's lives, the more needs you can find in the other party, the more items you can use for trading. Here's another example. We all know that over 90% of businesses worldwide are family-owned. This is especially true in developed countries. In reality, many founders of family businesses have sold their companies. When they sold their companies, they often received a high price. However, the success of these transactions was deeply satisfying the person's needs for intangibles, such as wanting to be respected as the founder, preserving the original brand name, displaying a picture of themselves with their children on a prominent spot in the company building, or being appointed as an honorary director on the board. In other words, if these intangibles are met, even if the price offered is relatively low, the deal will ultimately be accepted. Conversely, if these factors are ignored, the likelihood of a successful deal diminishes significantly. So in many transactions, money is not the most critical factor for both parties. But what if you don't know the other party's needs? It's straightforward to guess. If you guess correctly, that's great. Even if you guess wrong, the other party will often tell you, or at least provide some information. One student went for a job interview at a bank. He reached the final round of interviews after conducting detailed research on the interviewer in all aspects. But during the interview, he discovered that a different person was interviewing him. The student quickly looked around the interviewer's office and found a photograph of the interviewer with his children taken on a sailboat. The student speculated that the interviewer was likely interested in sailing. He then started discussing sailing with the interviewer and had a 40-minute conversation on the topic. During these 40 minutes, they talked about sailing, other sports, travel, and food but hardly discussed anything related to the job. In the end, the student got the job. So, think about it, did these two talk about business during those 40 minutes? Of course, they did. In these 40 minutes of conversation, they didn't seem to discuss anything related to business, but in fact, the general manager learned a great deal about the student. This included his ability to listen, curiosity, keen perception, broad interests, and the possibility of excelling in communication with clients. He also saw that the student was quick-witted, skilled in socializing, and could handle the responsibilities of the bank. The most critical point was that the general manager felt that working with such a person would be a delightful experience. So, intangible assets were the driving force behind this job interview. Of course, behind this successful job interview, there was another logic. By reaching the final round of interviews, the general manager already knew that the student had passed the previous rounds. It was evident that the student had the necessary skills for the job. Therefore, the final interview was not about his hard skills but his soft skills, those intangible elements. In conclusion, for a successful negotiation, several key points should be kept in mind. 1. Clearly define your goals and ask yourself what you truly want. 2. Understand who your negotiation partner is and learn as much about them as possible, uncovering their needs. 3. Be skilled at using non-equivalent assets to impress the other party, leveraging intangible values that cannot be measured in money to achieve your objectives. Real-life negotiations can be much more complex, but the fundamental principles remain the same. By adhering to these key points, you've already achieved success in a significant part of your negotiation. The rest requires practice, adaptability, and the ability to grasp the crucial points in different situations. Thank you and congratulations on completing another book. We appreciate your support and attention. Please subscribe to the Tim Booker channel, audiobook channel, give it a thumbs up, and share it with your family and friends. Wisdom is worth spreading, opening the door to a brighter future. Thank you and goodbye.